Okay, so hello everybody. Thank you for joining us for actually the last SEDS Online webinar of 2020. Um, today we will have a presentation by Clara Blettler, but first I want to thank IS for the sponsorship for SEDS Online. As always, um, you know, it, it really allows us to offer all of these great resources to you. So make sure and check out our website. There's virtual field trips, there's learning tools, all of the um, scientific webinars are recorded and posted on there, so make sure and check them out. Um, great things to use for all of this virtual teaching that we were just chatting about. So today, as I said, we have Clara Blettler, who's an assistant professor at the University of Chicago. And Clara received her bachelor's degree from Harvard before attending Oxford for a PhD and heading over to Princeton for a postdoc fellowship. Her research uses geochemical tools to explore the interactions between oceans, sediments, and the climate system. Today, Clara is going to talk to us about archives of glacial seawater and implications for carbonate platform sediments. And with that, Clara, I give you the mic and look forward to a great presentation. Thank you, Chelsea, and hello to everybody, wherever you may be. Um, I'm excited to share with you this story of discovery. Um, I hope by the end of this, I'll have convinced you that we have, for the first time, um, been able to sample ancient seawater that preserves a lot of the properties of the glacial ocean. Um, this is the most direct samples we have um, of those conditions. And so I'll explore some of the implications for paleoceanography and for carbonate sedimentology. So the glacial cycles, oh, I should have first said that this is an image of a reconstruction of um, the Northern Hemisphere ice sheets during the last ice age. Where I am in Chicago, we would have been covered over with glaciers. Um, and when you extract this water from the oceans to put it into these expanded ice sheets, you drop sea level and you make the oceans saltier. And you also end up removing preferentially lighter isotopes of oxygen isotopes and enriching the ocean in the heavier oxygen isotopes. And these oxygen isotope trends have, were the reasons why that we understand these uh, glacial cycles to have been um, cyclical over the Pleistocene. And this is one of the early records um, from the 50s using measurements of oxygen isotopes here interpreted to be um, a record of temperature. And you can see the now familiar cycles going back in time. These all now have nice uh, names, uh, marine isotope stage names. And it was debated even from this early records, um, how much of this record was controlled by temperature versus the composition of the ocean changing. Um, to orient you here, this is the modern um, going back in depth or in time. And this minimum here would be the last glacial maximum around 20,000 years ago. So as I said, the oxygen isotopes that you can measure in carbonate sediments such as foraminifera was understood to be a function of several different factors. You have temperature, you can have the delta O18 of the water, you have biology, different vital effects, and you also have the important effects of preservation. Now, over certain time scales and certain conditions, you can convince yourself that you are avoiding significant diagenesis, although on other time scales, this can definitely be an important player. We can also control for many of the vital effects by um, picking specific species, controlling for size fraction, et cetera. And so then at the end of the day, we're left with these two main factors, temperature and the ocean oxygen isotope composition that are going to be influencing the carbonate records that we can measure. And it's actually been debated which one of these dominates the signal. Um, Emiliani concluded that it was mostly temperature based on some assumptions about ice cap composition. And later on, Shackleton actually concluded that it was mostly the seawater composition changing. But now we have a better idea that it's actually a decently even mix of these two, maybe 50, 50, 60, 40 or so of both of these factors being important. And we can say that from um, a couple different, because of a couple different observations. One way to do that is you can have independent estimates of temperature from your favorite temperature proxy, magnesium to calcium, alkenones, um, pick your favorite one. And if you can constrain temperature independently, then you can reconstruct um, the remainder of the signal that is in the ocean water. Or alternatively, you could try to reconstruct the composition of the ocean oxygen isotopes from sea level estimates and then back out temperature. Or you could also use um, this method that I'll call the diffusive pore fluid method, 
to understand the ocean seawater composition change, and then again, back out temperature from this record. And I want to talk a little bit about what this diffusive pore fluid method actually does. Um, so here you see pore fluids, um, their oxygen isotope composition measured um, in a core. This is the sediment water interface here at the top. And when you go down, you actually see this increase in oxygen isotope composition, somewhere between 20 to 50 meters depth. And this is the signal of the glacial oceans having had a higher oxygen isotope composition and that signal diffusing and attenuating as it penetrates into the pore fluid sediment column. Now the boundary condition at the top has jumped back to its present values, but this signal is still preserved, um, albeit in an attenuated form at depth. And you can model diffusion in this kind of sediment column and arrive at a solution for what that glacial seawater composition would have been like. Here is another slightly higher resolution data set doing the same thing. You have this peak in oxygen isotopes in the pore fluids um, at a few tens of meters below the sediment water interface. So this diffusive pore fluid method was really important for pinning down what this ocean composition was um, and allowing us to assess the temperature contribution to carbonate oxygen isotope measurements. But it was also powerful for another reason, because you can do the same type of analysis with chloride in the pore fluids, which scales with global salinity. And again, you can see here that there's this subsurface peak in the chloride in the pore fluids in these sediment cores. And so from the same pore fluid measurements, you could get chloride and oxygen isotopes of the glacial ocean. And since chloride scales with salinity, you have controls on temperature and salinity, which gives you the density of an ancient bottom water mass. And this is really key for paleoceanography because you can start to reconstruct what the density structure is of the glacial oceans and how circulation might have worked. And this was put together by Jess Atkins. This is a plot um, 2D space of potential temperature of salinity. And so here you can plot all these different water masses from these are modern water masses that have a range in temperatures and a small range of salinity with density increasing here to the lower right. And using this diffusive pore fluid method, they reconstructed ancient glacial water masses to exist at these points here, which is interesting because they have a much smaller range in temperature, but they have a much greater uh, range in salinity. Um, the glacial oceans would have existed at average salinity around here. And so this difference suggested that salinity may have been much more important at driving glacial ocean circulation than it is today, where changes in temperature really control thermohaline circulation. So this is a really important um, concept for understanding uh, uh, glacial ocean circulation. But um, in recent years, this pore fluid, diffusive pore fluid method has actually been challenged by a few papers, um, I said just a few years ago, and they actually suggest that the diffusive pore fluid method is not really precise enough to constrain the glacial ocean composition and solve these kinds of problems. And that's because of the nature of the measurements. You have only a small fraction of the glacial signal preserved because it's been attenuated by diffusion throughout the sediment column. And in order to reconstruct the actual um, end member glacial composition, you have to make an assumption about the shape of the delta O18 curve, um, which may or may not exactly match the sea level curve. You also have to make assumptions about diffusivity and advection at your pore fluid site. And so all these um, uncertainties add up such that the conclusion of these recent papers is that this diffusive method is mathematically unable to resolve the salinity difference that I showed before. It doesn't rule them out but it maybe isn't a strong enough piece of evidence to start to reconstruct those um, glacial water masses in that way. So this leaves us wanting um, a more direct measurement of what the glacial oceans may have been like. And so I'll uh, show you now going ahead that I think we have found um, one such location where we have pretty pure sample of the glacial oceans that um, gets around some of these uncertainties in this diffusive method. And so this discovery came from um, a cruise I was on on the Jody's Resolution in 2015. 
This is the workhorse of the um, scientific ocean drilling, has been sailing for decades, producing a lot of really important results. This, um, as anyone who's sailed before knows, there's an amazing amount of effort from a lot of people involved to get these expeditions um, underway. And so this is um, a good fraction, not totally everybody, of those that sailed with us on this cruise. So we sailed to uh, drill in the Maldives. This is this island chain in the Indian Ocean, just north of the equator. And to zoom in, we have two rows of atolls surrounding an inner sea. And zooming in once again here, we see our drill locations marked here. I'll be talking, I'll be showing data from the locations in red. And so this inner sea is around 500 meters water depth. There are seasonally reversing currents that um, wash over this platform. And we have in particular this channel here in between these two active atolls, and then this basin area um, that we also have drill sites in. So I'll start off by showing a uh, transect through these three sites in this channel. This is an east-west transect. These are the seismic reflection data. The seafloor here, I said, is around 500 meters. And here is two-way travel time, which scales with depth. And so I can toggle back between the interpretation and the raw data, and hopefully you can see some of these features for yourself. So we have a um, ancient um, aggrading and prograding carbonate platform and um, slope that was then drowned. It ceased to grow in this way in the Miocene and was started to be overlain by these um, current influenced drift deposits before the modern sediments accumulating in the channel and inner sea start accumulating here. So this is the sedimentological landscape that we drilled into. Um, these are some of the ways in which we get these samples. Here are a selection of core bits and barrels and core catchers used to extract these cores. And here you can see that core barrel coming up and being recovered on deck. We then are able to take out the sediment core and its core liner. This is the catwalk of the Jody's resolution. And then, um, important for this study, we can extract the pore fluids that are sitting in between the pore spaces of the sediments. And so there's a couple different ways of doing this. We can um, extract them through these rhizon samplers by pulling a vacuum in the syringe and sucking out the juices of the sediments. Here you can see a series of core sections having their juices pulled out in this way. We could also squeeze out the pore fluids in these hydraulic presses. So you load up some sediments, put them in this contraption and exert a lot of pressure. And then the fluids will drain out into this collection syringe. Here's a closer look at one of these devices and the pore fluids being collected right here. So going back then to the data, we have this series of transects. Uh, we have this series of cores in this transect here. And um, these are those three sites, this 65, 66, and 68. And then these two sites are off towards the east in that inner basin. So the first hint that we had something really interesting going on here came from looking at chloride concentrations. Chloride is a very conservative element in seawater. It's really hard to um, change significantly because it doesn't um, undergo many reactions in the marine environment. And so very interestingly, we saw that there were these large increases in chloride concentration at depth in the sediment column. And we were able to rule out some of the few options for changing chloride in this way. You could change chloride concentration by dissolving evaporites, for example, if you had salt deposits, but we recovered the sediments here and we didn't see any evaporites. We could also, um, increase chloride if you're forming clathrates and extracting water into those mineral structures. But again, we didn't observe clathrates in these sediments. And you could also potentially have evaporative brines that sink through a deposit and could produce this kind of signal. But actually the chloride is not elevated enough to overcome the density difference between the surface and these depths over 500 meters below the sea surface. So we can really rule out any of these three mechanisms in explaining this elevated chloride signal here in the sediment. 
We also see an increase in oxygen isotopes in depth that mimics the chloride signal very closely. And as well in the hydrogen isotope ratios, delta D. And when we plot these three properties against each other, the chloride against oxygen isotopes or the hydrogen against the oxygen isotopes, we see these beautiful linear correlations here. Um, and in fact, this one, oxygen against hydrogen isotopes, very nicely follows this eight to one um, ratio, which is the slope of our global meteoric waterline. And so these relationships suggest us that this is really the glacial ocean that we are seeing preserved here that is um, the mass balance complement to the really isotopically depleted ice sheets that would exist somewhere off to the lower left in this figure here. And so in contrast to the diffusive core fluid method that had to go through this modeling exercise to try to constrain this attenuated glacial signal, here we have these large massive water masses at depth in the pore fluids that we can basically read off straight the values of these conservative properties of glacial oceans. Um, this here at the bottom left would be our modern interglacial water mass here in the Indian Ocean. And up here at the top right is our glacial water mass. And so these differences end up giving us around a 4.3% increase in the chloride which is um, greater that, than the global mean change um, as estimated from sea level estimates. We have a delta O18 change around 1.1 per mil and a delta G change of about nine per mil. I would like to say that this is um, LGM, last glacial mass maximum seawater, although I will acknowledge that we don't have a direct way of dating the seawater. And so it could be any of, these any of these glacial periods going back in time that are preserved here um, in the subsurface. I don't really know. I'm going to say the most, the easiest explanation is that it's probably the most recent glacial period, um, this one right here. But I want to acknowledge that age uncertainty. All of the methods that we might have wanted to use for dating the seawater would have been um, spoiled by reaction between the sediment and the pore fluid. So it looks like we have this, these pore fluids, this subsurface water mass that preserves um, the conservative properties of the glacial ocean. And there's also some really interesting information we can get from um, reactive tracers. And so I want to focus on this site here, um, U1468, which has this elevated chloride extending through great depths and then turns around a little bit at the bottom. So here on the left now, we have those three conservative tracers I discussed, chloride, oxygen, and hydrogen isotope ratios. And again, these all show a very similar pattern. And then on the right, I have two reactive tracers. These are calcium isotope ratios and the strontium content. Strontium may be more familiar to many of you. Um, in these types of carbonate settings, you can get quite elevated strontium because of the recrystallization of aragonite. When aragonite converts to calcite, um, it releases its strontium into the pore fluids and those can accumulate in um, these pore fluids to, until they reach um, celestine saturation. Calcium may be a little bit less familiar, so I want to show one data set from um, the Bahamas where this system has been better studied. Here is um, pore fluid data from ODP site 1003 on the slope of Great Bahama Bank. And you can see in this setting, we start off here at the sediment water interface around seawater, that's a zero per mil. And then over the top 100 meters, they decrease until the pore fluids are equal to the sedimentary value. And this reflects the equilibrium reactions as you have neomorphism and recrystallization of carbonate sediments. And so this shows that this is um, these fully equilibrated sediments with respect to calcium isotopes with their pore fluids. And this occurs, as I said, over this length scale here in the Bahamas. So he, we see also a similar pattern here, not exactly the same trend, but we see the seawater value at the top. And then we see some excursions towards lower values that reflect this more equilibrated and more extensively reacted sediment. And this is very much consistent with reactions with aragonite that are also reflected in the strontium content. Um, we also have some measurements from the sediments that I won't show, but they exist down here. So again, this suggests that this water mass here is pretty equilibrated with its host sediment. 
we can plot these two reactive tracers against each other. We have strontium against calcium, and we have this really nice um, anti-correlation. It's not a perfect linear one-to-one -one relationship, but actually we wouldn't necessarily expect that to be the case because you can have different end member sediments that are recrystallizing and ending up with different end members. And you could have different slopes if you have higher or lower aragonite content, for example. But we can identify the end members. So in this cross plot, we have our modern unreacted sediment here at the lower right. And we have our older and more extensively reacted sediments, more equilibrated sediments at the upper left. And we have these interesting trajectories as those water masses are reacting with their host sediments. So I've shown a few conservative tracers and I've shown a few reactive tracers. And so um, I'll challenge you to imagine if you could, what it might look like if you plotted a reactive tracer against a conservative tracer. This is the strontium concentration against the oxygen isotopes. When I plotted these for the first time, I was um, pretty surprised because this cross plot looks nothing like anything I'd ever seen before. Um, it looks like this. I like to call this my goose plot because I think it looks a little bit like a goose. And um, as strange as this looks, I actually do think that we understand what it means. So let me try to walk you through what this strange cross plot actually um, tells us. So it identifies at these corners, it identifies the different water masses that exist in the subsurface in these pore fluids. The head of the goose is this modern unreacted seawater and looks a lot like the Indian Ocean water that is bathing the current Maldives. And this wing of the goose is our glacial extensively reacted or equilibrated sediments, right? It has elevated oxygen isotopes and it, um, from that glacial saltier ocean, and it has elevated strontium because it's had aragonite reacting with those pore fluids. But interestingly, we also have these other water masses that we identify. We have a glacial unreacted water mass here. So it has elevated oxygen isotope but it hasn't accumulated a lot of strontium yet. And we have this interesting wingtip that looks like it is an interglacial water mass. So modern-ish Delta 018, and yet it's accumulated a lot of strontium along this path. And so if the extent of reaction as defined by this y-axis has something about relative age, it is possible that this water mass here could be something like the last interglacial, it's marine isotope stage 5e. Although again, the absolute dates on any of these is really just a little bit of a guess. So I could walk you through this um, one site, 1468, from top to bottom. We start off here, uh, bottom water. Then the, we move to this water mass, which has elevated oxygen isotopes and yet hasn't accumulated a lot of strontium. Then we move into the bulk of this glacial water mass with um, pretty extensively equilibrated um, pore fluids as defined by this reactive tracer. And then interestingly, we, as we go towards the bottom of the pore fluids, um, we sampled at this site around 800 meters below the seafloor, we reverse and we go back towards the bottom water. And so potentially this suggests that here at the greatest depths where we were able to recover pore fluids here, we may have younger Holocene waters that are penetrating this sedimentary environment. So um, just a reminder about the sedimentary context where we found these pore fluids. These exist in sediments that are much, much older than the um, proposed age of the pore fluids. The pore fluids are Pleistocene in age. They are probably from the last glacial, although potentially from previous glacial stages. Um, but they're sitting in host sediments that are millions of years old um, from the Miocene and into maybe the um, latest Oligocene. And so um, how do these pore fluids actually get here? We think that there is probably a cohort type convection system here driven by hydrothermal heating from residual heat from the Paleogene volcanic basement on top of which this sedimentary carbonate edifice of the Maldives has been um, built. So this is an east-west cross section of the Maldives now with our drill locations and their projections mapped here. Our observations 
um, are plotted here with our proposed water masses and their ages. So we have interglacial modern water masses and shallow depths. We have our glacial um, water masses here at intermediate depths. And potentially we have younger Holocene waters again um, at the bottom of this core here. And so I would like to suggest, although the evidence for this is really, um, we don't really have, that we have horizontal lateral advection through this edifice. We have heating and escape somewhere here in the inner sea. And I will note that we had um, previous cruises have observed fluid escape structures in the inner sea, often aligned with faults. And so it could be, um, that could be evidence for the natural closing of the circulation loop. Um, in order for this to be last glacial maximum seawater, I will say that this water will have had to move laterally through the Maldives sediments, um, covering around 25 kilometers in around 20,000 years. And so you could do the math. That would give you a flow rate of around a little bit over a meter a year, which seems pretty high relative to um, a lot of advection rates um, in other sedimentary systems. But it's actually not crazy considering a lot of groundwater flow systems that I've looked into. And I also want to note that we had extremely high porosity in the system. We had up to 50% porosity preserved down to 800 meters below the seafloor here. And so potentially this unusual observation could um, help promote or be consistent with the flow required to get this glacial water mass preserved where it is today. So I don't, um, I'm not gonna show too much data about the actual sedimentary composition, but I do want to say that if we have these Pleistocene age waters penetrating these Miocene age sediments, there's just a lot of opportunity for focused diagenic alteration, um, depending on the specific flow paths, which are dependent on porosity and permeability patterns, on the sedimentology, on grain size. And so, um, there is some evidence for um, targeted zones of alteration at some of these sequence boundaries, definitely here at the drowning point of this carbonate platform reef. Um, and this is ongoing work to look more closely at the sediments and try to understand in this advective regime if we can piece together the diagenic story in the sediments. So finally, I want to explore some of the paleoceanographic implications of this water mass. I'm returning now to where the Maldives sit in the Indian Ocean. We have um, a reconstruction of water masses today from um, oceanographic sampling at a transect here around 80 degrees east. So not exactly where the Maldives is, but covering um, pretty close by. And so what this shows us is this low salinity Antarctic intermediate water, AAIW water mass that today doesn't cross the equator and stops um, short, it stops in the Southern Hemisphere. And we have this more saline water mass um, covering the Maldives today in the Indian Ocean. The Maldives, if you projected this, um, this section west, would sit right around here at five degrees north or so. During the last glacial maximum, it was suggested that we had um, a further northward penetration of this Antarctic intermediate water mass, such that it would have bathed the Maldives. And this means that this low salinity water mass would actually be the water mass at these intermediate depths that is penetrating laterally into the Maldives and whose properties we are able to read off in the pore fluids. Um, so, um, fitting this then into this broader temperature salinity map that I showed earlier, we have again our modern water masses here and our reconstructed glacial water masses shown here, reconstructed from this diffusive pore fluid method. Now the global mean salinity at the last glacial maximum is estimated to be around here, 35.5. And from reading off the conservative tracers in our pore fluid water mass, we think that this um, location in the Indian Ocean samples glacial Antarctic intermediate water right around here. This means that any bottom water masses would have had to be more dense and probably more saline. And so this um, observation suggests that these estimates from the diffusive pore fluid methods are actually not crazy at all. We haven't really recovered evidence for anything like this very saline water mass in the Southern Ocean. 
But certainly we have much bigger spread in salinity than we seem to have for modern bottom water ocean masses. Um, this um, represents, I said, an increase of around 4.3% uh, um, salinity increase over modern oceans, which is um, greater than the 3.2% or so of the, of the um, whole glacial ocean. And so I would suggest that this is consistent with the idea that salinity variations were more important in driving thermohaline circulation in the last glacial maximum. So to um, summarize the conclusions, I hope I will have convinced you that these uh, pore fluids that we sampled in the Maldives seem to store deeply advected glacial, um, possibly LGM, although again, the age is uncertain, and Holocene seawater. Um, we think that this has been advected laterally through geothermal coho convection. And this puzzle was uh, really uh, revealed to us through the use of both conservative and reactive geochemical tracers. We think we've identified the origins, the ages of these water masses, at least in a relative sense, as well as their um, extent of reaction, um, which tells us something about the history of the chemistry as they've moved through the sediments. The implications for um, sedimentology are that we have really young waters that can advect through um, older sediments, Miocene sediments, you know, more than 10 million years old. And so this actually um, should be a little bit of a danger signal for those of us that think about sedimentary geochemistry, because these are sediments that have been buried there hundreds of meters below the modern depositional surface, and they are still an effectively an open system with respect to um, uh, their pore fluid geochemistry and still have potential for experiencing active um, marine diagenesis. There's also implications for paleoceanography, in particular, how we try to reconstruct thermal haline circulation during glacial times. This seems to be a pretty unique sedimentary system. And I will acknowledge that it's not the place in the world where you would really like most to constrain a glacial water mass. You would really love to have one in the deep Pacific, but this seems to be the one that we have. And so we think that this location records and member um, glacial seawater in a glacial Antarctic intermediate water mass. And the constraints we have from chloride concentration suggest that relative salinity differences were in fact more pronounced than they are today. So finally, I want to thank again, all the people that were involved in collecting these samples and contributing to this work. Um, all the people in the IODP expedition and my co-authors on this, John Higgins and Peter Swart. And thanks also to um, Chelsea Peterson for connecting me to this SEDS online community. Um, it's been fun to talk to you today and I welcome any questions now. Super, thank you so much, Clara. That was a wonderful presentation. And I am very happy that you accepted our invitation to give a talk today. Um, I think that was wonderful. So everybody, you can now type your questions in the chat. Please send them to everybody, not directly to SEDS online and make sure and tell us where you're watching from. Well, Clara, while we wait, um, I have a couple of questions as per usual. Um, so I'll start with one that I have about um, the inferred recrystallization that you have with depth. I'm wondering what the sediments say. Do you have drastic changes in mineralogy that you can track um, the changes in strontium? Um. So we don't actually have a great record of the aragonite um, transition and the strontium changes in the host sediments, but that's not necessarily um, surprising because the sediments that would have been reacting and influencing the pore fluid geochemistry are the ones that are upstream, right? And so the modern host sediments are actually maybe not the ones that are most informative for telling us the extent of reaction. And so it would have been great if we could have gotten a series of cores upstream and track those, um, yeah. the composition, but it's just not information we have given the drill samples you recovered. But I can say that there is a clear decrease of aragonite concentration with depth. So if you believe that aragonites would have been de depositing over these time intervals, then they are gone, they have been lost. And so the strontium would have ended up somewhere, potentially in the pore fluids. And we also have um, some dolomitization at some horizons. And so there is definitely sedimentary diagenesis that we can observe through changes in mineralogy, 
but we don't really have a great control on the upstream sediments that are the ones that are actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. So you guys didn't drill in those upstream sediments then, unfortunately? No, we were drilling for different purposes to reconstruct the facies and age date um, these uh, great deposits. So um, yeah, they weren't drilled with in mind with expecting to find this. Um, these types of trends, these yeah. Corpus, yeah. <laughs> sure. Okay, I know we have some questions coming into the chat now. Um, Rachel Wood has a question. It seems like she had the same thought process as I did. So sorry, Rachel, for snagging that underneath you. Um, but so hopefully now, uh, yeah, everybody understands a little bit more of what might be happening with those sediments. Um, Ola coming from Newcastle says, fabulous talk, very inspiring. Thank you, Clara. Um, okay, good. So while we're waiting for more, I had a couple more questions for you. <laughs> um, so in the calcium plots that you showed, the calcium isotopes decrease with depth, but then they actually replenish a bit at the lower parts of the plots. And I'm just curious if you want to mention something about what might be causing that shift towards yeah. more positive so, Yeah, so this is my suggestion that we may have a younger Holocene age water mass penetrating here at around 800 meters. Um, mm -hmm. um, that is underneath a older, more extensively reacted, maybe slower affecting glacial water mass here at these depths. And as you can see, basically all of these tracers reverse towards this 800 meter mark, um, towards, um, towards values that are more consistent with um, modern bottom waters, modern ocean waters. Mm -hmm. So the conservative tracers turn around, they look more like interglacial waters. The calcium and the strontium reactive traces also turn around and look more. So it looks like this is younger, less extensively reacted water, which means that this um, depth profile doesn't preserve the relative um, age uh, pattern with you know, younger on top, older below, but there's a really complex structure of advective water masses moving here, sometimes um, mixed up in uh, terms of age and depth depending on the flow paths that might be available for them. Okay, and then you, you're assuming just a mixing from the, in, the water is being input at, say, what is that, 800 meters? Yeah, the water. it looks like mixing, particularly this really linear relationship in strontium looks very much like mixing um, diffusion between this water mass here and something potentially younger below. Yeah, okay. Um, and then one sort of connected question then I would um, ask about that. So you did show some, I think it was Paleogene volcanic um, basement below your sediments. Yeah, exactly. Is there any way that you could have brine fluids coming up um, from any of the, the volcanic basement where you could be or, yeah, inputting some of that strontium and we could, yeah. Years. I would say that um, the good agreement we have between multiple conservative tracers and multiple reactive tracers kind of points us to the process that I've described as opposed to volcanic brines or something like that. So for example, if you had um, strontium source from the basin, we haven't measured strontium isotopes on this, but that would be an obvious way to try to test mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily expect that the calcium would um, be responding in exactly the same way. Um, it's very consistent actually with the slope of different um, calcite or aragonite and members dissolving. Mm -hmm. And you probably would expect different relationships with um, volcanic source uh, fluids. And also just in the conservative tracers, we also have this, this great agreement between the oxygen isotopes and the deuterium and the um, chloride. And so again, if you were mixing in volcanic uh, source brines, you'd probably expect very different behavior in oxygen isotopes that mm -hmm. would destroy this really nice relationship, linear relationship that points us to this being a glacial water mass. And so um, those um, multiple uh, tracers really uh, give me confidence that these are the main processes that are uh, dictating the geochemistry as opposed to a volcanic brine. Yeah, does, um, do, does anybody plan to measure the strontium isotopes? Um, I could think about doing it one day here, maybe. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, just, just to check, but. Yeah, I mean, the expectation, right, would be that the strontium isotopes reflect Miocene age sediments that, again, those upstream sediments, wherever the mm -hmm. aragonite is, that is dissolving. Yeah. Um, that, that it actually could be anywhere from Miocene to modern. We don't really know the age of the sediments that would have interacted upstream. Mm 
So that would be the prediction. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, we have a question from Stephen in the chat um, coming from Wales. So sorry if you missed this, but how realistic are the flow rates of one meter per year within the platform? So this is reasonable um, for most people that study groundwater um, and uh, you know terrestrial hydraulic systems and carbonate sediments. Um, in fact, it's on the low side for a lot of those flow rates. It does seem high relative to the advection rates that were estimated in the Bahamas actually, based on uranium series evidence. Although I would suggest that some of those data come from these very limited, um, more superficial circulation cells that aren't necessarily on this large scale. And so given the porosity that we see, um, we don't have lateral permeability type uh, measurements to constrain it, but um, based on large scale circulation systems of this sort in carbonate sediments, this doesn't seem like an unreasonable number based on um, groundwater hydrologists I've talked to. But I defer to others, maybe someone else in the audience has a better idea of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we have Bill coming from cold Ottawa. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> um, he wants to know if porosity is irrelevant with, or invariant with depth, since it's 50% at 800 meters, or is it more extensive dissolution associated with deeper Holocene fluids? Whoops. Um, let me just pull up this slide. So this is the porosity data. Um, it's pretty invariant. Um, it decreases from the surface to around 50%, it stays there for most, um, most of these two cores. Okay, so pretty steady with depth and it seems. Pretty steady, yeah. yeah. 100 meters or so. Okay, any last questions? Make sure and get them into the chat now. Give everybody one more minute. Okay, well, with that, um, Clara, thank you so much for this presentation. It was, um, it was really great. And everybody joining us for this week's webinar, remember that next week we will be taking a break from our scientific webinars as we'll be hosting the BSRG. And please check back in with us in January for our scientific webinars starting in 2021. So have a wonderful holiday season if we don't see you. And um, we'll talk soon.